Y por favor, para que uno de los invitados termine de conectarse. off right okay i'm back miguel oh there you are marley okay is dr marley here uh, marley's here I, well i can see him oh, yeah. i can i can see him too Good. welcome dr marley sorry welcome both of you thank you welcome. Okay, uh, so can we can we start? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor Doctor uh, Harris. I want to speak in Spanish for for a few for a few minutes, uh, introducing to to my students and the other guests. Bueno, muy buenas tardes, eh, eh, queridos estudiantes del curso de métodos de excavación, métodos de investigación arqueológica 2. Estamos acá eh, con la presencia de nuestros invitados, el doctor. Edward Harris y el doctor eh, Marley Brown. Eh, el doctor Edward Harris fue el que inició el, eh, el método de eh, análisis estratigráfico denominado Matriz de Harris, justamente hace más de 45 años, eh, allá por 1975, aunque él ya venía haciendo esos trabajos desde, 19, desde fines de los 60 en, los, en el sitio de Winchester, ¿no? donde participó en varias temporadas de investigación. El doctor, el doctor Harris eh, es uno de los más eh, citados y prominentes arqueólogos, eh, eh, sin, 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 sin temor a equivocarme del mundo, es, eh, tiene, sus libros han sido traducidos a casi todos los idiomas conocidos, ¿no? o sea, bueno, por lo menos los idiomas eh, de habla eh, inglesa, japonesa, coreana, árabe, en fin, ¿no? en casi todos los idiomas que nosotros podríamos imaginarnos, excepto los nativos. ¿no? Eh, el doctor Marley, Marley Brown, asimismo, ha, ha colaborado y contribuido en diversas publicaciones para la práctica de los principios de la estratigrafía arqueológica. Justamente, el doctor Brown es eh, una de las personas que ha introducido el, 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 el análisis y el uso del método de matriz de Harris en los Estados Unidos y Canadá. Él es coautor de uno de los libros llamados Prácticas de estratigrafía arqueológica, ¿no? es, que es una especie de, ¿no? digamos, de, de libro en la cual se, se practican todos los principios del libro Principio de Estratigrafía Arqueológica, editado por el doctor eh, eh, Harris en 1975. Entonces, les doy la bienvenida a todos. Eh, eh, también, eh, muchísimas gracias a todos los no estudiantes del curso por su interés y a todos los profesores de la Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos. Especialmente quiero eh, eh, agradecer a la Escuela de, Profesional de Arqueología de la Facultad de Ciencias Sociales por eh, todas las facilidades eh, eh, para poder pues, tener esta importante e interesante reunión. Justamente aquí está conectada la, la doctora Ruth Chadi Solís, que es la directora de la escuela. Doctora Chadi, muy buenas tardes y muchísimas gracias por su presencia aquí también. 
Gracias también a ti por haber eh, promovido esta reunión. Hemos invitado a los colegas que están trabajando en diferentes lugares del país. Espero que estén ellos interesados también. Estoy segura que sí. Y muchas gracias, pues, al colega Harris. Eh, muchas gracias, doctora, doctora este, eh, Ruchadi. Doctor Harris, doctor Brown, eh, let me introduce you to eh, doctor doctor uh, Ruchadi Solís, uh, a prominent Peruvian archaeologist and um, And, and the director, of the, uh, the dean of the uh, uh, archaeological department of San Marcos University. So she, she's here to welcome you and, and also to thank you for for your conference and presentation. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> vamos a empezar a escucharlo. Um, la, entonces, la, la charla del doctor este, Harris. And, uh, Dr. Harrison first turn, right, or Dr. Brownman first? Um, I think I'll, I'll go first. Um, okay. So what, I, what I'd like to do is perhaps just speak for 20 minutes or half an hour, mm -hmm. and, then, and then open the floor for any and all questions. Um, because I presume that some of you would like to know how I, I came to be before you today um, and, and how the matrix uh, came into being and the, the small book that then uh, evolved out of that and also so this, this book is nice and slim and then later later With, with Dr. Brown's help, we produce practices of archaeological stratigraphy. Perfect. Now, Perfect. I, I do have, I do have some pictures in a PowerPoint presentation, which uh, Miguel will kindly. Um, okay. 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 Dr. Harris, can I first read your uh, bi biographical information before you start, please? Um, yes, I, um, I was born on the island of Bermuda, so like all of you in Peru and Dr. Brown in the United States, I'm an American, if you will, although we're still a British colony. Um, I was educated in Bermuda and at Columbia University in New York City, and then in the summer times, back in the 1960s, I would go to excavate in Winchester uh, in the summer uh, to learn how to be an archaeologist. Uh, I on an English to do my PhD, and as happenstance had it, I was able to do my PhD on the principles of archaeological stratigraphy, uh, which then resulted in the small textbook, uh, which is now been translated into 12 other languages. So that's it in a nutshell. Dr. Brown is a long time a friend of mine, one of the first exponents of uh, stratigraphic principles according to what we laid out in the book in the United States, along with another colleague, Adrian Pretzelis in California. And uh, so Marley and I have been friends, colleagues, Um, and he's been a great supporter of the matrix and the principles uh, over, for over 30 years. Marty also has a wide knowledge of American archaeology, let's see, archaeology in the United States, and uh, I'm delighted he could join us today uh, to give some of his insights into the general uh, situation regarding Uh, stratigraphic methods in archaeology. Marley, perhaps you'd like to say a few words about yourself? Sound. Have you got your sound on? How's that? That's better. Excellent. Uh, 
I'm a historical archaeologist, uh, and uh, we often work with sites that are pretty complicated stratigraphically. Uh, I was introduced to uh, the principles, uh, not at the uh, beginning, but it took about a decade for me to appreciate what Dr. Harris had developed in England. Uh, some of you probably know the methods, particularly excavation techniques, recording techniques. We owe a lot to uh, British archaeology, uh, and uh, he is one of many archaeologists uh, who've come along over the years, going back to really the 19th century, who've helped us everywhere learn how to do uh, proper excavation and, more importantly, how to record uh, the physical evidence that we find in the ground. So I came to understand his approach in the late 1970s. And when I took the job as director of archaeological research at Pony Williamsburg, a big museum in Virginia, it occurred to me that I should apply uh, his approach. In, and when I say approach, I don't just mean the matrix and uh, the specific techniques for recording. I'm talking about the way we conceive of archaeological sites in very general terms, uh, really almost theoretically, the way we uh, envision them, what they are, and how we go about taking uh, them apart. And I'm sure we're going to learn more uh, about that uh, in a few minutes from Dr. Harris. So thank you for including me, Miguel, in this uh, interesting session. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang. So, uh, can I start like uh, presenting your slides, Dr. Harris? Yes, please. Thank you. You're and welcome. if I could just say next when I want the next one, um, That's awesome. I'll, I'll probably be, I'll probably go through quite quickly, but we can always return to a particular image if people want to discuss it later. Basically, I'm going to give you an overview of how the matrix came into being and then how that um, ended up with the book and the insistence that we have our own stratigraphy, not geological stratigraphy, but archaeological stratigraphy. <coughs> so, uh, Thank you very much. Um, uh, my opening sentence there, the title is... Stratigraphy rules the world. It's a fact that in terms of geology, if we consider people as a part of the geological record, the fact of the matter is that once we began to build things, to excavate in the earth, and to change the topography, the geological topography of the earth and the geography of the earth, we have created a whole new epoch or era of stratigraphy, if you will. And we have made stratigraphic units, the like of which nature has not made. So, for example, if you consider the Pan American Highway, longest road in the world, it's a great stratigraphic unit all the way from Alaska down to the tip of South America. So, stratigraphy, we have imposed on top of the geological world a massive amount of new stratigraphy, which goes according to the rules of archaeological stratigraphy by and large and not by geological stratigraphy. So that's the sort of general background. Next. Next slide. Miguel? Yeah. Can I do it? Anyway, this is neither here nor there. Let's go on to the next one. The next slide. Go to the next one, please, Miguel. Can 
I do that? Can I move the slide? Miguel? Uh, we go, all right, okay, just stop there. Um, so I'm then, sorry, it's, uh, sorry it's, it's a little slow when I pass the slide. It takes right. like a few seconds. That's fine, that's fine. We'll just hold there. Um, okay. So, in 19, 1965, I started university in Miami, at the Univers University of Miami, and we had a teacher in humanities who said you could go to England and they would pay you 50 cents a day um, and you could learn to do archaeology. So I dropped out of university and in the summer of 67, I went to Winchester along with some 200 other volunteer students uh, to learn how to do archaeology. It was a, a magnificent uh, six summers of doing absolutely wonderful archaeology. And by that, I mean it was wonderful uh, stratigraphic material. I only wish I had known about the Harris Matrix back in the 1960s. I could have done a better job. Next. Can I have the next one? Sorry. It's taking a bit of time. Anyway, let me to say that we were taught to excavate by the methods developed by Dame Kathleen Kenyon and Mortimer Wheeler, who I think we can say in Britain at the time were probably the most foremost stratigraphic archaeologists, um, uh, particularly uh, Kathleen Kenyon. In her book, uh, she lays out uh, some of the incipient theory behind principles of archaeological stratigraphy. And a lot of this was based upon excavating stratigraphically rather than in arbitrary levels so that you removed the layers and archaeological features in the reverse order to which they were created. Miguel, can we see if we have the next slide? I don't know if we can... Can I move them or is that... Uh... Not possible. Can we have the next slide or is it, it's not moving? Um, I, my slide is in Norway, Norway, 1972. Yeah, so we've gone a bit. Can you go back a few? Yeah. Go back another one. Yeah. And one more. Okay. Right. Uh, right. So uh, this is one of the, the sites that I uh, worked on uh, over two summers in 1970. And the views you see uh, present the plan of the topography of the site at certain levels uh, uh, during the excavations. And so we're starting in the 1400s, and then in the right-hand slide, we're working back. So we've removed the tile floor, and underneath of it, we have pits related to the uh, construction of the building. Next slide. The next slide, Miguel. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Um, and underneath that, there was another layer of construction with even larger holes for putting scaffolding and that sort of thing to build the walls of the building. Underneath of that, 
uh, you see irrigation trenches for the Anglo-Saxon period. And underneath of that, the next slide. Have the next slide, Miguel. Well, no, too fast. Back one. That's it. Great. Underneath of that was a Roman building where you can see the tessellated, red tessellated floor underneath of it. Now, the important thing here, and the reason why I'm showing you these planned views or views of the surfaces, is because of the overriding importance of surfaces in stratigraphic analysis, which we'll come to later. But anyway, the method of the day uh, was to stop when you thought you were at a significant surface and you would make these elaborate plans of the site as you see this hippie uh, making here. The problem with this is that these were composite plans and they were put together, uh, some of which is true, but they were put together to represent the surfaces of the site before any analysis of the artifacts. And in many cases, what you were recording was the different surfaces exposed during excavation, not surfaces that would have been in use at a particular time because of the interleaving of, of stratification. These plans took a great deal of time. They stopped the excavation in some cases for several weeks. Um, and what they did was lock you in to a phase or period of the site which you couldn't change after you analyzed the artifacts. You simply, that's what you had, that's what you've recorded. And of course, because it takes so long, you can only do it every so often when you decide you're at a significant surface. And if you have a site which doesn't have tiled floors or Roman tessellated interiors of buildings and so on, the surfaces were not recorded because they weren't considered significant. So surfaces compiled of sand or clay or whatever weren't recorded because they weren't considered significant because the importance of surfaces in stratigraphic analysis was not fully appreciated. Although there were movements uh, with uh, Mortimer Wheeler Kathleen Kenyon, and with uh, the Biddles who ran the excavations at Winchester, Winchester, moving towards an understanding that there was something important, more important about surfaces, but it was not crystallized until we did principles of archaeological stratigraphy. Next one. Next slide, please, we go. So, in 1972, uh, I had finished six years of summers of digging at Winchester, learning the British method. I went to Norway, a wonderful site on the waterfront in Bergen, uh, where they'd been excavating for many years, tremendous stratigraphic material, uh, a lot of which was timber rather than stone walls and soil and so on. It was all timber buildings that burnt down from time to time. So I was told how to record the stratigraphic material as they were doing it then in Norway. Um, and uh, we won't go into the details of that, but simply to say what happened was it caused me to think, well, who is doing it correctly or is there a, a correct way? Were the British doing it correctly or were these people with the archaeologists in Norway doing it correctly. So this started um, the thought process uh, that something had to be looked at in terms of what was the right way or wrong way or several ways of recording stratification on archaeological sites, regardless of their cultural content. 
Anyway, it got a bit too cold in Norway because we dug through the, the, the winter. And in fact, we at some point we had the site covered with blankets with heaters underneath of it. So in the morning, you could dig the melted stratification uh, up because it hadn't frozen overnight. But anyway, enough of that. I went back to England. Next. So I went back to England and, and uh, I started, I was hired to do post excavation analysis on one particular site that had been excavated over six years, uh, starting in 1965, the Lower Brook Street site. And what I was told to do was to sort it out. And that was the instructions, sort it out and to phase it. What we now know this means is make a stratigraphic sequence for the site. But in those days, no one really used that term, stratigraphic sequence. Um, it just it didn't, didn't exist in common usage, as it were. Um, and what I was given for this one site was some 70 notebooks. 70 of them, seven, zero, full of stratigraphic information. This unit is under that one, it's over this one. This one is over that one, it's under that one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thousands of them, thousands of stratigraphic units at a very complex urban site from Roman times uh, into post-medieval times. So that was my job uh, beginning in 1973. Next, next picture. So I begin to feel that if I couldn't see where I was going, literally see in an illustration what was happening, uh, you would go completely mad because it's almost impossible uh, or it is indeed impossible. If I read here that this unit, this layer is on top of this one and it's over that one, it's related to this. And by the turn, I turn two more pages and do a few more. You cannot grasp it verbally. You just can't cope with it. Um, so we had, you see on this chaos on the left, uh, we started doing these spaghetti junction diagrams to try and make some sense of all this stratigraphic data that had been excavated over six years. Um, and then I thought the spaghetti joints were just again too confusing. So I started to formalize it a bit on the drawing on the right. Next. Next. Thank you. And on the evening, I was working late on the evening, the 28th of February, 1973. Uh, and I had a piece of gridded metric paper underneath the last drawing I showed you. And I started doodling and I made these little half rectangle boxes with a space in between them. And after I had a group of those, it became obvious that we had something, we had a solution to seeing this stratigraphic data. And uh, as <clears throat> I consider it to be an artistic uh, revolution, if you will, it's about seeing, it's not about reading about it and so on, it's being able to see. And so I went on like a madman and produced this uh, sheet that you see before you, which is now lost. Uh, and I called it in jest, the Harris matrix, from the point of view that a matrix is something that you could put information into uh, and come out with a clear uh, picture of it. Now you'll also see in this drawing in the bottom, it says Winchester layer chart. 
And I mention these things because, again, at the time when I did this work, what was of importance was what you could dig up, not surfaces. Surfaces don't exist unless you record them. So we were intent as diggers on digging. And so the chart, as we called it, the layer chart, now known as a stratigraphic sequence, was called a layer chart. And any surfaces in it was referred to as features as they were doing of the day. So it took some considerable time after this to work out that what we were looking at was the true stratigraphic sequence of a site. Next. So I went back to the work that I was doing with the 70 site notebooks, 250 profile or section drawings and, and composite plans. Uh, the problem with composite plans, you can't break them apart. They're, that's what you've got, that's it. And over a three month period, I compiled the stratigraphic sequence on this, in this new format um, for this site, which had been previously excavated. So I sorted it out. The important point here, of course, is now you do this as you dig, so you don't have to spend years after the fact trying to sort it out. The interesting things about stratigraphic sequences, which you can see an early indication of here, of course, in a general sense, they give you some view of the site, some idea of the site. Pictures disappeared. Thank you, Miguel. So it's just looking at this particular thing for this one site, uh, which was about three meters deep. 20 meters by 30 meters in area and contained over 10,000 stratigraphic units that had been recorded. The important point here is that most of the surfaces were not recorded. So the site was under recorded considerably. But here you can see at the bottom is the Roman period. And then in a sort of sense, you get a contraction in the Anglo-Saxon Dark Age period, if you will. And then there's an explosion of construction of houses on the site after about 1400 or so. And that's reflected in the stratigraphic record and it's reflected in the shape of your stratigraphic sequence. So this took about uh, as I said, three months to compose. <clears throat> now, in many instances, we found, and Dr. Brown and I did some work on this in, in a couple of places, that it's almost impossible after the fact to reconstruct stratigraphic sequence if the records do not contain enough stratigraphic data when they were excavated because at the time they didn't have the rules and regulations to make sure that the right things were recorded. Next slide, please, Miguel. So if you look at this one, this is the Anglo-Saxon period that I just showed you there. Um, and if you look at it in detail, you'll see that a number of the units are unstratified, either below or above. But as the whole site was excavated, you know that there must have been material above and material below. But in the records, the information has become unstratified. So if you look in the, in the middle here, I can't sort of point really, but you'll see that there are some boxes with nothing underneath of them. There are other boxes with nothing on the top of it. So they've become unstratified in the records, although they were stratified on the site. And this is the problem of, of trying to do it after the fact. Now, if this site was excavated again, there would be no such anomalies. Everything would have a connection above it or below it because that is in the nature of stratification. 
So we began to understand that uh, the stratigraphic sequence of the site was not the stratification. Stratification is the compressed part of the uh, stratigraphic record, and your stratigraphic sequence is what is expanded uh, to give you a diagram like this. The stratification is three dimensions. Your diagram is four dimensions because it has the time element, relevant time, relative time uh, in it. So uh, this was <coughs> the beginning of further questioning as to what archaeologists were doing in their excavation and recording, which meant that your stratigraphic sequence could not stand up fully. Um, I have here a little friend of mine, chap here. I'm sure some of you had these as children. I always had one. But if you think of this as stratification, well, this is the stratification, but it's all like that. And if you've done your job properly, it comes alive and it's the stratigraphic sequence standing up. So the relationship these layers might have been touching earlier are not relevant by the time you make your upstanding stratigraphic sequence. So the difference between stratification the three dimensions of the physical world and the stratigraphic sequence is the difference between the physical world and the abstract world, the four-dimensional world of the stratigraphic sequence. If you would like to look at it in another way, every archaeological site, if you will, has its unique DNA, which is expressed in this model, this four-dimensional model, which is unique to each site. And that is its value to history, that each archeological site has its own unique stratigraphic sequence, unique DNA, if you will. But if you use the matrix, you can compare them because you're recording them by universal standards, which is what we have to do. The cultural content of the stratigraphic sequence is not relevant in the first instance to creating the stratigraphic sequence. You must do that based upon the physical evidence. Next. So at that time, in 1974, Professor Biddle uh, was doing an excavation of the Roman South Cape at Winchester, and you can see several periods of the gate. There are some big timber post holes for the two entrances uh, going through the gate, where it was all a timber facade, and then it's later replaced in stone. And you can see one of the returns of the town wall and the entrance into the town. And because this was being excavated at the time, I was able to be involved in it, and we made a stratigraphic sequence, not quite when we were digging, but almost immediately thereafter, so that a number of the anomalies that normally took place in records could be resolved. And so the matrix for the Southgate Street site is probably the first true stratigraphic sequence uh, for an archaeological site. Now, even this one has its problems because most of the surfaces were not recorded. And the surfaces provide the key to stratigraphic interpretation and indeed to the reconstruction of the archaeological site. The problem with surfaces is they don't exist unless you record them. They're like time. They're a concept that you have to record by making a plan, putting heights on it, ultimately to make a contour plan of the site or each individual surface, which you can then later combine into a topographical plan of the site through time. So this site here 
the stratigraphic sequence here, again, is under-recorded, uh, probably by about 45 to 50%. It's important to look at it the other way. There are always more surfaces on an archaeological site, even if by one surface that you didn't excavate underneath, then there are deposits. So this was the first time we did a, a, a stratigraphic sequence very near to where when the site had been excavated. Next. And so I went on from there because I think you could probably appreciate one became rather obsessed with the whole matter. Um, and in this drawing, I show you I've got the stratigraphic sequence on the left. The middle drawing, I've divided the strata or grouped the units of the stratigraphic sequence into phases. That is to say groups of uh, say, all the walls of a particular building or something like that. And then you can represent the phases in a stratigraphic diagram as well, which is on the right. And your final thing with all of this, of course, is to translate that back like after you've analyzed the artifacts and every other bit of information that you have, which will help you to uh, show the topography of the site through time. Now, of course, if you record every surface on an archaeological site, as you should do, you can, you can argue if, let's say, this site has a thousand surfaces on it, um, you can add each surface, and each surface that you add in your topographical plan is a phase you can say, I've got a thousand phases for the site because I've got a thousand surfaces. Now, it doesn't work like that because obviously most periods, surfaces are a combination of surfaces built up over time, including walls standing, the surfaces of standing walls and so on. And it's most important to remember that people don't live in the deposits, they live on surfaces. And so surfaces are of vital importance, and, and I'll go on about this, but they're absolutely of vital importance to the whole business. I sometimes ask an archaeologist, what, what is the final outcome of, of all the work you've done on the dig? Now forget about the artifacts. I just, what, what all that stuff that you dug up, the deposits and the surfaces you've recorded and so on. What, what is the outcome? What should be the outcome? And of course, the outcome is that you should be able to reconstruct the topography of the site. So if you will, the stratification is the geology and the surfaces are the geography. And this is the symbolism of archaeological sites. You've got to capture the geology in order to reconstruct the geography, the layout of the site through time. And generally speaking, um, at the time the matrix was invented, this was only done in a minor way where you were able to identify because you had a, a nice mosaic floor or something whatever it was, you were able to identify something you thought was a significant surface. The point is that the stratigraphic analysis to arrive at a decent stratigraphic sequence is based upon the surfaces, not the deposits. Next slide. So I'm telling you all this uh, in retrospect, um, but the time that it took to do this um, was about five years. There were a number of blocks uh, that got in the way of understanding what it was that we were looking at in these stratigraphic sequences. What is the nature of an archaeological site? Um, and that we had to jettison the few stratigraphic rules we'd gotten from geology and to create our own archaeological stratigraphy 
because we do things <coughs> that are contrary to what nature does in creating geology and we have to account for those. Anyway, when you looked at, what are then determined is when you look at the relationship between any two stratigraphic units, there actually are only two possible relationships. They're either above or below one another, or they're not related. The one that I say C here, the correlation one, which I used in the early days, is not necessary because you can cover that in your phasing. But the stratigraphic relationships are two. They're either in superposition or they're not. Um, that is to say, the in, in particular, the surfaces. And so once you do that, you can then build up a stratigraphic sequence. Now, in the old Wheeler method, You'll see the little square box, uh, which became very popular for a while to dig into little boxes like that, which is fine. Um, you, and you can dig in very big boxes. It doesn't, it's not really relevant. But when evidence was presented, you normally are only given one section and, said, and told, this is what it's all about. This is how the site works, and this is the dating of it, blah, blah, blah. But in a box like that, the four outside sections are actually all one section. They're just in a circle. The only way you can understand that stratigraphically is to make a stratigraphic sequence. So you can make a sequence for each section. You then have to combine them into a single stratigraphic sequence into rules that we later put together as the law of stratigraphical succession. Now, of course, What's missing in these is all the information that you dug up. And in many cases, that's a problem with older excavations. You don't have that information in terms of surface plans, so you cannot sort out the stratigraphic sequence unless it touches the, the, the sections. But anyway, you feed in the other information that you got from surfaces, and you end up with your final uh, stratigraphic sequence. So I had made these diagrams at the time to, to indicate what the nature of archaeological stratigraphy was all about. Next. Now the old method, I say old, but at the time uh, when I started archaeology, the section was supreme. It was the, the reason, if you ask an archaeologist, what are you all about? What is your identity? They would hold up a section drawing. This is archaeology. This is an archaeologist. This is what it's all about. Um, the problem with sections is that we can't dig sideways. If you're going to dig stratigraphically, you have to dig from the top to the bottom. The problem there is that you can only have a section every so often. And you can't have enough sections to make connections between all the stratigraphic units of the site. It's just impossible. You have to do that through your plans, through your recording of the surfaces. So sections, by their very nature, or the reliance on sections as the be-all and the end-all, of stratigraphic recording and interpretation were hamstrunging the interpretation of archaeological sites uh, because they ignored, to, by, to a large degree, all of the information between your sections. And sections can only ever be selective. You can only have one or two. Now, you can record every surface. And that's the difference between the two. You can only selectively record sections unless you want to be there forever, digging sideways, but you can record every surface. And it's important to remember as well that there are many surfaces which have no deposits associated with them. So they're not surfaces of a deposit or something. They are 
entities unto themselves like the invisible liner of a post hole or a grave. They are entities unto themselves created by the destruction of pre-existing stratification, which is why there are always more surfaces than there are layers on most complex sites. So this was one of the problems that we had to overcome uh, was to change in British archaeology uh, and I'm looking at these things retrospectively, you have to understand that, it wasn't all obvious at the time, uh, was to move away from looking at the section to looking at surfaces. Surfaces, all important. Of course, some people didn't like this because this is Mortimer Wheeler, Dame Kathleen Kenyon, and all the icons of British archaeology. This, this is the true way at the time. That's fine. It's just changes were coming. Next. So we did an experiment uh, with chap, now Dr. Patrick Ottaway. He was digging on a prehistoric site uh, on the edge of the town. And uh, I said to him, now listen, I'd like you to record every surface. And I don't want you to record it like they're doing on these other things and recording every rock in the, in the, it appears in the surface. I want a contour plan. I just want an outline of every surface and some spot heights for your heights of the, your elevations and so on. So he did it. And this was the first site, as far as we know, where every surface on the site was recorded. And of course, once you have that, you can build the site starting at the earliest surface, right through to the latest. Next slide. So what we were doing is changing from the one dimension of a section to four dimensions of the stratigraphic sequence, because you're taking the sections, you're including the surfaces, which are all these black lines, and you're adding your relative time. So we're changing the paradigm of archaeological stratigraphy to four dimensions from one in terms of iconic views of the thing. Next. And the problem with all of these are the holes, the surfaces, if you will. Next slide. The problem with surfaces that don't have any deposits is that they disrupt the sequence. And if you don't take them into proper account, you cannot make a stratigraphic sequence. So here's a, a drawing that was done as a teaching tool back in the 50s, a section, and then it, the layers are numbered and so on. But they didn't number any of the surfaces. So that was their stratigraphic sequence after the fact. And this is the true one where the surfaces like a pit and so forth are recorded. Now again, you'll immediately say, well, you haven't recorded the other surfaces, so this stratigraphic sequence is again under-recorded, which is true. I was simply trying at the time to illustrate that if you don't take account of these surfaces which destroy pre-existing stratification, you cannot build a decent stratigraphic sequence. Next. And so on it goes. And part of the problem at the time, um, we're going to run through a bit of things. I've gone on a bit. Um, when they were doing excavations in the 50s and so on, and having these bulks uh, separating the things and so on, um, they were basically excavating here and separating the stratigraphic data in there, by and large, from the, the stratigraphic uh, data in the sections. And of course, and I did it myself in the 60s, when you removed the bulk, you didn't go back and record the stuff in the middle of it, you just took it away as quickly as you could. So Mortimer Wheeler's classic drawing above here, uh, which many of you have seen about the excavator's trench, the concept was replicated by the archaeologists themselves on their digs in the 50s. Next.
So if you look at the recording of an archaeological site, in the old way, if you will, you've got your boxes, you excavate, you record a few surfaces, you end up with tubes of records, the sides of which are recorded as sections, and one or two surfaces are recorded, but everything else in between is missing. They started doing composite plans underneath the middle part, which made it a bit better. But finally, when you record every surface, you can have a complete stratigraphic record of the site through time by the overlapping of your surfaces. Next. And also at the time, there was a great move afoot to expand the size of your excavation. So instead of having a small box, you had a big box. Um, and this is the, one of the classic drawings by Felix Barber or Barker of what became known as open area excavation, um, which was a, a good concept because you could actually see things that don't get clouded by bolts and so on. But it wasn't accompanied by an emphasis on, on, on recording every surface and so ultimately would fall short. Next. So what we began to realize that it, uh, any archaeological site or even in this section, there are two types of periods. There are periods of use and periods of disuse. And when you have your stratification, it's all uh, jammed together. Your job is to unravel that into periods of deposition or disuse and periods of use, which are the surfaces. And so immediately uh, you, uh, you get twice as many phases on a site as would have been agreed or decided on in the 1950s and the 1960s when surfaces were ignored. But this is the reality of it. This is the ge geology in depth versus the geography of the surfaces. Next. And so we devise a very simple method of saying this is the information you need for most surfaces. You need a, a boundary and some spot heights. That is it. And this is reflective of the very nature of the stratigraphic process, whether it's geology or archaeology. You have erosion and accumulation. So you have the creation of surfaces, the creation of deposits. Um, we do some things a bit differently, digging, digging pits and so on, redepositing the soil, making new layers and so on. So if you do this for every unit, you can overlay these and you have a complete history of the topography, the build up of the site through time. Next. And it's, it's the surfaces which provide the key to the stratigraphic interpretation because there are more, always more surfaces than there are uh, stratigraphic units. So I then went and I, in 1977, I was digging in the highlands of New Guinea, uh, wonderful uh, stratigraphy from the point of view, you had a thick layer of, of uh, peat, and then you'd have a, a volcanic ash, which had filled up this garden and preserved it. Um, and the point here is that the main feature of this was simply the surface. The stratification at the end was irrelevant. The garden is the surface. If you didn't record the surface of this garden, you didn't have the garden. And the same happened with the house sites, which uh, one of which I excavated up there as well. So this was further reinforcement, um, and this is 1977, uh, further reinforcement of the nature the, of stratigraphic accumulation and the importance of surfaces. Next. The other issue that was relevant at the time, and hopefully it doesn't apply too much nowadays, is that some people believe that a stratigraphic approach to excavation was to dig things in arbitrary levels. Uh, now, this is fine if you had a uh, a deposit uh, of uh, heavy refuse, all the same material, 
quite deep. Uh, so you cut it into uh, individual uh, levels and, and excavate it by individual levels. But when you do that on a stratified site, what you're doing is destroying surfaces before you can record them. Um, and so arbitrary excavation uh, has no place on sites that are stratified unless you're using it as a digging method in one particular stratigraphic unit of which you've already recorded the surface before you dug it. Next. Uh, we don't need that one. Let's go ahead. Next one. Anyway, there's any number of things that have happened now. Of course, things have developed in the last uh, almost 50 years since the matrix has been around. Um, and it, it, the stratigraphic methods that we have espoused are being used in uh, forensic archaeology where you end up in court. And it hasn't happened yet, but eventually it will one day. There'll be a court case um, in which someone will have to go and present the stratigraphic method as the only way you can properly excavate a site and capture evidence that will stand up in court. A lot of the old material that was excavated will not stand the test, will not stand up in court. Next. Next one. And so there you have my friends in um, Vienna. That was the birthday party for the 25th or 31st anniversary of the, um, the Matrix, uh, which they had a party for me in, in uh, Vienna. And on your left, you see a, a gentleman working on a stratigraphic sequence, which covers that whole table that he's working on there. But this is in the nature of it. It's a very complicated matter when it's finally finished. But if you do it during the excavation, you build it as you go. So it's not complicated when you can only dig at a certain rate. Next. And finally, uh, the interesting thing in a way is that the iconography, if you will, of the matrix and so on has been able to segue very interestingly into the, the digital age. And, and uh, it's now being used on the computers and all that sort of thing and so on. But the idea of having a stratigraphic unit in a box that you group a group of boxes into a folder and so on is all there in Microsoft or uh, Apple computer or whatever. Um, but the point of it is that the stratigraphic methods in principles are of universal application because stratification is everywhere the same. It doesn't matter the cultural context, it's everywhere the same, either a deposit or a surface. Um, and you should apply the same methods to it. Where it then gets interesting is when you start feeding in the cultural material that you've excavated, the documentary evidence that you might have, et cetera, et cetera, to fill out the skeleton of the stratigraphic sequence. Next. And anyway, and there, there's still major issues to be sorted out. Uh, for example, uh, most learned societies do not have any rules about how you should excavate a site, which is totally bizarre. It's as if we were engineers and you didn't have rules and you didn't have to pass certain exams to make sure a building stands up when you build it. But the fact of the matter is that most of our learned societies do not as yet have ethical standards relating to the excavation methods. Now changes are coming as well in the book on the left. Um, some people in the United States are now using strategic archaeological methods to analyze a fire scene and arson scenes and this sort of thing. Because of course those are archaeological sites after the event has taken place. Next. And so on it goes. The party they gave me, all the food was Roman food, or tumuli with bodies in it and so forth. Anyway, next one. And the 
the concept is passed into ordinary life. So there's the cat named Kathleen Wheeler, which for people in England is a, a bit of a, a joke, as it were. Kathleen Kenyon and, uh, and Mortimer Wheeler. And a friend of mine, an Indian archaeologist, named his son for the Matrix. Next. And again, it's appearing in, in sort of general things, books and so on. Next. Keep going. <clears throat> Keep going. Next one. Next one. Don't worry about these. Anyway. We won't worry about the rest of them. These are just, uh, the, the, the book has been translated into uh, 12 other languages now. The uh, Chinese had just appeared. Um, and, uh, and, and we did practices, as I mentioned earlier, with Dr. Brown. And um, so of interest is the fact that after almost 50 years, this particular scientific method has held its own uh, in archaeology and uh, will continue to do so uh, because we got the principles and the concepts correct uh, in, in the uh, late 1970s. So it was my honor to uh, be able to be involved in this journey uh, in, in terms of archaeological stratigraphy. Uh, to me, stratification is the wonderful thing about archaeological sites. Uh, that's why we exist, is in relationship to archaeological sites, which are all uh, stratigraphic units. And our job as digging archaeologists is to find, recover the stratigraphic sequence for the site and to record it in such a way that the site, the geography of the site, can be reconstructed uh, at any time in the future. So with that, um, I, I probably have said enough. Um, sorry, I've gone on for a bit longer, but um, Dr. Brown and I would be delighted to take any questions. And Dr. Brown, you may wish to say a few words, uh, having listened to my diatribe. Um, it's been too long <laughs> since I've heard uh, this uh, wonderful uh, exposition of why we do it the way you suggested we should uh, back there. Uh, excellent, uh, an excellent reminder to me. And I wish I was out there to make sure that people were doing it properly. Uh, and the younger archaeologists, I hope, particularly those who got a chance to hear you today, will take this to heart and uh, appreciate uh, the way uh, you've laid out how we should think about archaeological sites, but more importantly, the difference, as you say, between geology and geography and the importance of recording of the surface. And it's, uh, it's in archaeological field work. Thanks. Answer some questions Thank you. for the students. Thank you. Yes, Miguel, anybody who has any questions, any, any questions at all, try and answer them. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Harris. Um, before I give the word to Dr. Brown, I wonder, um, I would ask to, to the students if they have any questions. Um, chicos, eh, estudiantes, eh, alguna pregunta que deseen hacerle al doctor eh, Edward Harris hasta este momento? A ver. Yes. O alguna de, de los de los este de las personas que estén eh, escuchando, ¿no? Que necesariamente no que puede, no sean estudiantes, pueden ser profesores eh, o cualquier invitado. Tiene eh, puede levantar la mano. So I didn't get that. Miguel, can you repeat it? We have, we have a question, Dr. Dr. Harris, from Alan Galindo, one of my students. He says, have you come across an archaeological context whose area had vertical strata? 
How will the principles of stratigraphy, especially the principle, principle of temporality, be applied to spaces in which there are vertical and inclined strata? Yeah, so one of, the, one of the developments has been to apply stratigraphic principles to upstanding stratification, if you will, like walls, rock art, uh, any number of uh, structures or creations uh, that people make uh, that are not the normal superimposed lying down flat uh, units. And uh, so there have been uh, several a number of uh, books and articles written on these subjects, uh, but basically you apply the same stratigraphic principles as when I mean, you're looking at things as to which came first and you build your stratigraphic sequence accordingly. So for example, people who are looking at rock art, look at the overlay of paintings where a, a hand might overlay another hand or an animal, painting of an animal, whatever, and treating those as stratigraphic units, which they are, of infinitesimal thinness and making them into stratigraphic sequences to help them to understand the chronology of their particular type of site, which is uh, paintings on walls. Um, it's incredibly useful for the understanding of buildings, upstanding stratification, if you will, and uh, again, I, uh, we had a great discussion about this in Havana uh, many years ago, and I think I did a small paper at the time. Uh, several other people have done papers about the application of stratigraphic principles to standing uh, buildings. Anything that is created uh, by us, in a sense, is a stratigraphic unit. Um, I remember very early on, there was a diagram of a parts diagram for a lawnmower published by an archaeologist. And what he was trying to demonstrate was that if you want the lawnmower to work properly, you have to take it apart in the reverse order in which it was put together. And then when you put it back together, you reverse that process. So. Um, principles of strat archaeological stratigraphy can be applied to anything that people have touched and made. Um, and, and increasingly, people are using it for all sorts of areas where you would think they wouldn't. So it's very applicable to upstanding stratification and stratification that's not on the level, if you will. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, there's a, a lot of questions here. Uh, he says, what is your opinion about the work of Bruce Harsler and the adaptation that he used uh, to when he made uh, temporal matrix, spatial matrix, and relation matrix? Um, I, I, I don't know if I was clear. Sorry, was I, did, he say, did you say Carver? What is your opinion about the work of Bruce Hartzler? No, I don't know if you know him. Marley, do you know about that? We're no. Like, no. Um, no, we'd, we'd like to be sent some information on it. I could answer it at a later point, but I'm not familiar at the moment with uh, uh, the person or the work that you're talking about. Okay. Sorry. Uh, colega, colega Harry Pizarro, de repente, este, Gracias, gracias Miguel. Quizás si me podrías ayudar en la traducción porque mi inglés no es muy bueno. Eh, justamente estamos eh, viendo un programa que se llama el AIDIC, donde eh, en base a unos trabajos, eh, acá lo tengo, uh, a ver, dame un segundo, eh, unos trabajos realizados por, por Hasler en, uh, en el sitio de, a ver, 
discúlpame, que se me perdió la, la data. Eh, disculpame, se me perdió la data. Bueno, eh, este, este autor eh, realiza eh, unos eh, estudios en el uh, sitio eh, Agora, en uh, un sitio ateniense, en base a una escuela de campo. Y eh, ha creado un programa donde... Eh, como que desarrolla las matrices, eh, ¿no? basado en el sistema de, de Harris, el autor Harris, pero ya distribuye hasta tres tipos de matrices. Matrices de relaciones, como has mencionado, matrices espaciales y matrices temporales. Y mi pregunta era si, eh, ¿qué, ¿qué tan conveniente es eh, separar las matrices eh, así en, la, en, distint, en las distintas dimensiones que eh, la matriz Harris por sí sola eh, las agrupa, ¿no? Ok, ok, gracias, este, Harry. Ok, doctor, doctor Harris, um, uh, I will translate what he says. Uh, apparently, uh, Bruce Harsler is um, it's an archaeologist who developed uh, an application, another, another software called IDIC. And he uh, used your matrix model to apply it to different, to three different uh, kinds of uh, metrics, uh, which, which are Temporal matrix, spatial matrix, and the other one, relation, relation matrix. Uh, so I, 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 I assume you don't know what his work or his uh, his contributions yet, but it's so it's a uh, it's, it's kind of a person who used the base of the Harris matrix contributions you made to develop a new software and the three different kinds of matrix now. So uh, maybe it's something you can. Take a look in the, in, um, in the web. No, I, I, I'd be delighted to have the references, both Dr. Brown and I would, and I can certainly answer your questions, try to answer your questions later by email. And certainly anybody who has any questions, um, mm -hmm. uh, Miguel, Professor Miguel will have my email address and you can email me about anything you like and I'll try to answer them. The point about the uh, matrix in general or stratigraphic sequence models or diagrams in general is that you can do a tremendous amount with them in different ways um, and and uh, uh, some people have uh, a lot of it hasn't been done hasn't been developed but the important thing now i think for us is the the advent of the the pc computer and so, for example, a friend of mine uh, has developed a thing called the Harris Matrix Composer, which he's offering for free now, I believe, um, through which you can feed in your stratigraphic data and create a stratigraphic sequence. Now, once you have that sequence, there are any number of things that you can do with it, depending upon your imagination, what type of data you want to feed into the sequence um, and you can do anything you like provided you don't change the stratigraphic sequence based upon the other information particularly artifact information that you might put in the whole point about stratification is that it's undesignedly commemorative of the past nobody goes out to create stratification and therefore, it's an unbiased record of the past. If you do your job right when you're digging and you create a good stratigraphic sequence for the site, that is it. You can do all sorts of things with it after the fact. And I'll look forward to seeing the information you're talking about um, because there are any number of possibilities and things that you can do to enhance the outcome of your excavation to provide more clothes for the skeleton of your stratigraphic sequence. And having the ability to computerize stratigraphic sequences is an absolutely enormous one. Of course, going along with that, you have 3D laser scanning now, which makes the recording of surfaces an absolute breeze in a sense. And it makes the reconstruction of the topography of the site um, a press of the button, as I'm sure some of you are already doing. 
the other day I had a, a, a thing from England which uh, was a 3D reconstruction of a, a, a cathedral um, by scanning, 3D scanning and so on. Absolutely wonderful stuff recreating the past. And we need more of that to, sort of work done on ordinary archaeological sites to make them uh, come alive. A lot of people are probably doing it. I'm, I'm not aware, but that's not neither here nor there. The point is that once you have your stratigraphic sequence, you can work it in any way you like. You can add in all sorts of information if it's going to help with your interpretation of the site, provided you do not use any of that information to break stratigraphic relationships which you found in the ground or in the wall. So I would look forward to getting this information and, and, and having a look at it. But um, we're in early days yet uh, in terms of fully uh, exploiting uh, stratigraphic sequences. A friend of mine called David Bibby in, in, in Germany early on did a, a paper about the permutations of stratigraphic sequences, which is a whole huge area of potential study for archaeologists. Uh, because when layers aren't in superposition, so they're like that, how do you determine the absolute dating of them? except through the artifacts or some other information. Now, you can't change where they are up and down on the, on the uh, sequence, but they can be moved up or down in terms of a date um, calendar on the side. So um, the whole point is that stratification is the essence of our information package for history. If you do it stratigraphically, record it stratigraphically, you can do any number of things, uh, depending on the imagination, to use the stratigraphic sequence to expand your understanding of a site. Thank you very much, Dr. Harris. There's a, an interesting question here. Voy a leer una pregunta que hecha por la señorita Sabrina. Dice. Si las interfaces de instrucción solamente son rasgos o ameritan una, este, un registro especial, ¿no? o, o son ellos un estrato en sí mismo. Okay. Uh, are, it's about inter, interfaces. Are interfaces of instruction only a subset of interfacial features that merit a special recording, or they are stratification units on its own right? Uh, that's a question that the, the, one of my, some of my students are, uh, are very interested in because uh, are interfaces a strata by itself or they just, we just should know the nature of the change between one strata and the other one, Dr. Harris? A very, very important question. Um, and uh, I'm at fault for this, if I can put it that way. Now, as I said earlier, when we had the first stratigraphic sequence diagrams made with the matrix diagram, we called them layer charts. And what you have to understand that language traps you. The things you do and the language you use can trap you in certain ways. So it was called a layer chart because the emphasis when I was taught how to dig was on digging up the layers. It wasn't on the surfaces. So um, it became a layer chart. So uh, you get caught in these things. Now, when we were trying to understand um, the importance of surfaces, um, we again were trapped a bit by what had happened before. So on the sites in which I was working with, they had what they called features and what I later called interfaces. So a grave, the actual cutting of the grave, the cutting of a post hole, the cutting of a foundation trench became a feature and it was given a feature number. Um, and 
its surface was not necessarily recorded. What was recorded was the top of it, where it cut through other things. Um, so I should do something to correct this, but let's put it this way simply. Forget about interfaces, just call them surfaces. Surfaces, surfaces, surfaces. Now, again, we, coming out of, uh, of geology, um, some of the language traps are there as well. So they talk about unconformities in geology. So what they're doing is defining things in terms of, of, of deposits, not as surfaces in their own right. And so I use the interface uh, at the time because I myself did not fully appreciate that we're simply talking about surfaces. Now, there are different types of surface. There are surfaces that are in their own right and they have no deposit because they were created by digging a hole or in the wall or whatever. And there are surfaces that define the upper extent of a deposit. Now, my friend, Dr. Wolfgang, who you can get his free Harris Matrix composer, if you like, um, when he records things, he also records the bottom surface after he's dug it. So he ends up with a bubble, a capsule, which gives you the complete volume of the stratigraphic unit that you could dig away. Um, so I apologize that I've never really corrected this, but forget about interfaces, call them surfaces and appreciate that some surfaces are only surfaces and some surfaces are surfaces created by an underlying deposit that was created and then made a surface. So if we go in in modern terms and I lay a concrete floor in a schoolroom, the concrete is the deposit this, it supports the surface and the area of the surface. Um, but that surface, the other important thing about surfaces, and this was pointed out in geology, and it's one of the things that changed geology years ago, was that surfaces nearly always occupy more time than deposits. So we've laid a concrete floor in the schoolroom and the concrete deposit was laid in a day. The surface could be used for a hundred years, reused and reused and reused, worn out. Da, 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 da. Um, so the point is that on an archeological site and on geological sites, surfaces often represent far more passage of time than the deposits. And in fact, in your country, and in somewhere like Rome, for example, or London, wherever, you've got buildings, the surface of which has been in use for 2000 years or more. So surfaces are terribly important as a concept. And I apologize for using that phase interface. And again, this is language trap. What is it the inter of? It's the interface between deposits, instead of saying, it's a surface in its own right. And some of them are surfaces of deposits. Some of them, their own surfaces with no deposits. And it's those ones which disrupt your stratigraphic sequence by penetrating through earlier stratification. So this is a, a, a very important question. Thank you for answering it. Um, I will, if I do any future lectures, I will put this into my talk that that this, this was, um, what's, the, uh, what's the expression? It was a false path. Um, it, it, it was a dead end. Interfaces are just surfaces. Treat them as surfaces, and there are two types of surfaces. Thank you very much. It was a very, very interesting uh, question and answer. I wonder if Dr. Marley Brown, who brought the, the, the introduction of the famous book, uh, Practices of 
Okay, guys, stratification. Want to say something about this question also, since you wrote uh, that introduction. Well, to... I appreciate that, Miguel. And I, I would simply add an example to what Dr. Harris just laid out, and that is think of a post hole. We find a lot of post holes here in my area, and the cut. So you 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 dig a post hole, and the surface is the bottom the cut. You have to get down to that and you have to clean that out. And then you put the post in and you backfill it, the post. And so when you're digging a post hole, you're going to find the mold if you're lucky. And so you come down to the post, to, to the surface of the post hole, you record that. You then have to deal with the mold and you then have to decide what's next, and that's the backfill that's up against what was the post. Then you have, and all of these have to be recorded. And all of these, and correct me when I'm wrong, Dr. Harris, because you know I don't know this the way you do. Uh, any number of those are surfaces that need to be recorded as you're digging a post hole, starting with the top, then the I won't, I have to be careful now. You've told me not to use the term interface, but the interface between the backfill that's up against where the original post was that's now rotted. So we have to, we have to record the boundary between the backfill and the rotted post. That's the surface, right? That also needs to be recorded on down. So even a simple post hole can, result in how many surfaces? Three or four, right? At least. Yes, three or four surfaces, a, yes. A simple post hole. Yes. Not some kind of elaborate uh, ruin that's been there, as you pointed out, been there for millennia, but just a post hole that was part of a, a, an earth fast building that may have uh, stood for 30 to 50 years uh, during the 17th century. So. It's a complex business, but you've got to think about it, as you pointed out. You've got to think it through. And even on a site like I've just described, which could be a plow damaged site, where there will be no uh, stratigraphy, really. It'll be plow zone, subsoil, and features, or as you say, what we used to call features, like a post hole. Think about them in terms of surfaces that need to be recorded and i you know i wouldn't know any of this dr harris if it weren't for you man i'll tell you <laughs> it's great and i hope the students miguel i hope your students have um, been able to take a look at this book and uh the first couple of chapters of his book when i read those it really just opened my mind in a way that even though I thought I had some idea what I was doing in field archaeology, I really had no idea what I was doing because I hadn't thought about what I was uh, doing when I was out digging. And it was really only until I read his book that I, and I didn't read his book until uh, maybe 1980. I hate to admit it. It's terrible. I'm sorry, Dr. Harris, but you, your book wasn't published until what, 1979. So I read it pretty soon. All those years that I was doing the wrong thing. But thank you, Miguel, for uh, including me. And I appreciate this class. It's great. Thanks to you, Toronto. Uh, it's very, it's very uh, interesting for us when like when we go digging and we need to like just we know the people who's digging know that that was an ancient surface even if it's like if it was a cut or a floor but uh, when you when you read at the, at the diagram you, it's very it's very important to to graphic or to explain what was the nature of that concept of that change exactly. and that change was an ancient surface which Many times we don't recognize it as it, and we just forget about it. And we right. Forget. Well, that's because you know many surfaces do not have a physical existence. I mean, they 
they not, as Dr. Harris said, they not, you know, you have deposits and the focus was on layers and deposits. The, the boundary between them, the top of a layer is a surface. And if sometimes, uh, if you don't have a Roman mosaic floor, as he points out, you may just have a hard packed earthen floor, something that's very ephemeral that you can only feel with the edge of your trowel if you're a good digger, you know, if you're a good excavator. That is a surface. That needs to be recorded. And as Dr. Harris points out, you have to start recording as you're digging. You can't wait, and you certainly don't want to wait uh, for months uh, after the dig to sort this out. You have to begin to try to understand this as you're digging. And my experience has been with students, especially when we're digging in uh, one meter squares, which is what we use, even when we're doing open area excavation, we record arbitrarily horizontally in one meter squares. It's very hard to teach students when they're just getting started in archeology span to see the big picture that needs to be recorded when they're in a hole the size of a one meter square and you're trying to get them to understand what Dr. Harris has laid out for us this afternoon. You understand, so it's tough. It's very difficult. No, I think I've, I've just I've just been here to uh, listen and add uh, uh, to what uh, Dr. Harris has had to say, and I hope uh, that your students have been able to benefit from his uh, excellent presentation. And I know that I saw some questions on the screen that had to do with the relationship between what he uh, developed and using the techniques uh, that have become very sophisticated in this day and age uh, of frequency seriation, building on the tradition of frequency seriation dating in, uh, in particularly in North American archeology, span but it's certainly a worldwide uh, approach now. And there are many archaeologists who are working on combining the sophistication, increasing sophistication of statistical dating techniques with the use of the matrix, putting the two together so that you can refine the chronology of your site. But remember, as Dr. Harris said, you come to the contents of the deposit after you've recorded the site using the techniques he's laid out in his book and that have been uh, you know, perfected and refined over the last 50 years by any number 
of uh, archaeologists in many different countries. So frequency variation, used, you can use absolute uh, and incorporate absolute dates. You, know. you can use a combination of fine grain variation using date ranges back during the historic period, uh, coming from things like pipe stems, maybe. Those are very interesting developments. And I think, and I know you understand this, and I know it's very important to the way you're teaching, that the two of them have to be brought together. And uh, Dr. Harris and I are not trained statisticians. That's, I think, fair to say, uh, Dr. Harris, that you and I were not trained in either the, the ins and outs of rate of dating or of fancy statistics. Uh, what's that word? The B. Bayesian, uh, I can't even pronounce it, but, and I let alone amend it. I, I don't think I did very well in my statistics class when I was uh, studying archaeology as a grad student. But anyway, they too need to be used together. And I think you have to start, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Harris, you have to begin by understanding what you put out there and recording, taking apart the archaeological site and recording it using the stratigraphic sequence, the techniques to record the stratigraphic sequence, then you can bring to bear these uh, very impressively uh, developed in recent years uh, statistical techniques for dating, right? Well, uh, the, the most, most important point is that the stratigraphic sequence, am I getting an echo? Um, is the testing pattern for all later analysis of artifacts and whatever else you, you want. And so it, it once you have the stratigraphic sequence, there are any number of things that you can feed into it uh, to expand your understanding of the site. I, I, Miguel, I'd like just to make a general point for, particularly for the students. Um, I once, when I was in, in, in uh, Australia, there was an archaeologist there now deceased, uh, but who insisted, he insisted on being buried with his trowel and his digging clothes and everything very good. Um, but his view of archaeology was that if society was a caterpillar tractor with a big bucket, that archaeology was on the leading edge of the bucket. And in my view, what you're doing as an archaeologist is incredibly important. No other profession, in my view, has taught people more about what we are, who we are, where we came from, than archaeology. We have a sacred duty when we excavate these sites to capture them properly, to grab their stratigraphic sequences so they can be analyzed forevermore afterwards and re-examined and compared with other sites so that we can add to the knowledge of human beings throughout the world. And the essence of that is the stratigraphic approach in digging and stratigraphic recording, without which our information is useless and all we've done is dig a hole into history. So, it's a wonderful uh, profession. I wouldn't even call it a profession. I don't think I ever considered I was working. It's a wonderful um, avocation. Um, and if you have uh, an ability to dig, not everybody does. Some people are better at art analyzing artifacts. But those of you who dig have a sacred duty to do it right and to capture that information which you are destroying as you dig. And you're, the day you walk off the site, you should have your stratigraphic sequence rolled up under your arm because that is the testing pattern for all later analysis 
no matter what type of statistics there might be, no matter what it is, it all comes back to its truth is determined by the stratigraphic sequence. So, for example, you could have a stratigraphic sequence and you got lots of carbon-14 dates out of deposits. So you plug them into the deposits in the sequence. And very simply, you could then start to see, well, things are not in absolute chronological order here. Why is that? What, what, what is this read about? Whatever. The point is that the stratigraphic sequence is the groundwork, the immutable framework for all later analysis of archaeological sites. And once you've done that, you can do any number of things. And any other archaeologist who's not a digger and has some other um, specialty, no matter what it is, study of buildings or whatever, of graveyards or whatever, you have given them the foundation for understanding the chronology, the relative chronology of that site when you excavated. And you've given them the surface information so they can reconstruct the site through time. If you look at archaeological reports, you have to look a long time before you see much in the way of the surface reconstruction and discussion. People talk about the artifacts that are in the deposits. Well, you know, this is all well and good, but there's an interesting dichotomy here as well, which I just mentioned very briefly, but you can almost say that anything found in a deposit relates to a story somewhere else, even if it's only on the other side of the site, because it's been put into disuse. It's been brought and put into disuse, and then you live on top of it. So what is the relationship between the muck you're living on top of and the surface you're living on, and so on? So it's uh, stratigraphy in archaeology is a wonderfully potentially complex subject, but it's the way in which we can get more information out of every archaeological site, every artifact that's found, and the setting, the landscape setting, and the people who inhabited the sites, and so on. Archaeology is an incredibly vital profession or avocation, and any of you persevere in it, uh, you won't work a day in your life. You'll be doing archaeology. Totally, totally accord, Dr. Harris. Uh, bueno, chicos, uh, hay una última pregunta. There's a last question that we, uh, an interesting question too. Uh, dice la pregunta si hay alguna limitación para la matriz de Harris. Entonces, ¿a quién mejor que preguntarle que al, al, al inventor de la matriz de, del método de Harris? ¿no? Entonces, vamos a pasar la pregunta. Uh, Dr. Harris, there is a question from Alberto Valdivia. Uh, he says, is there any limitation for the Harris matrix? And we would like to know if Dr. Harris has a, 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 an answer for this question. Say it again. If, is there any limitation for Harris matrix? Limitation? Yeah. Um, what, would you, what would you say about this question? No, once you, once you have done your excavation, and you have defined the stratigraphic sequence in the Harris matrix format, um, there, the only limit to what you do with it after that is really up to your imagination and where your interests lie, um, what your particular uh, research bent is and so on. Um, it, it is eminently expandable, if I could put it that way, to do all sorts of things, a lot of which haven't yet been done, in my view. It is, it, it's, it's a remarkable tool once you have ascertained it for a particular site. And because it's the testing pattern and it's unbiased, I come back to that again, the stratification of the site is an unbiased, it's uncommemorative, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting my quotation wrong. Anyway. Uh, undesignedly commemorative of the past. Nobody goes out to make stratification. We make stratification as a byproduct of living. 
and dying or whatever. And so your stratigraphic sequence is one of the most unbiased pieces of historical data that exists. If you look up some historical documents in an archive or something like that, there are all sorts of issues with it about its reliability. Who, who did it? When was it done? Is it a copy? What is so forth and so on. When you dig an archaeological site and you create a stratigraphic sequence, you have unbiased record of the past. And you can do anything with it following that, and it, you will use it to prove or disprove questions about the information that you're putting onto it or applying to it, as long as you don't use that information to break the relationships that you have determined when you dug the site. So it's eminently expandable. As I said, the whole question of permutations of stratigraphic sequences has been touched very little because it's an enormous problem. And before computerization, you couldn't do anything about it. So for example, I made a little site one day and had a stratigraphic sequence of 13 units in four different lines because they weren't all, they were all like a deck of cards. For those 13 things, there was something like 252 possible relationships in absolute time for those units. Now you need computer power for that. But then of course, when you throw in other information, such as the surfaces, such as the buildings, it might have been built and so forth, you start to knock certain things out. But it's eminently expandable um, and, and usable as a, a tremendous tool in all areas of archaeology and other areas uh, as well. Because again, I say anything that people create are stratigraphic units in one way or the other. If I make a book, if I make a book of documents, it's a stratigraphic unit. When I find it, it's bound in a certain way. The pages, if you will, are a stratigraphic sequence, but then you may find that someone's ripped one of them out or inserted another one and so on. Stratigraphy is all around us. It's what people do all the time as a byproduct of life. If you like riding Harley Davidson motorbikes, you understand stratigraphic principles because you know how to take it apart in the reverse order to which it was made and put it back. If you build buildings, you understand stratigraphic principles because you're doing it that way so the archaeologists can do it the other way when they find it. So stratigraphy in your everyday life, if you get a sense of it, uh, uh, if it really lights your mind, you will see stratification all around you in all sorts of circumstances um, and, and uh, it will enhance your worldview. Correcto, doctor Harris. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, bueno, entonces, eh, es, para responder a esa pregunta, ¿no? eh, también quisiera agregar de que el, los límites son las propias, eh, li, digamos, es la propia imaginación en la configuración de la interpretación, el, en el planteamiento de las preguntas de trabajo, de, de, los, de las hipótesis. Digamos que un buen, un buen, una buena estratigrafía es la base para poder probar o o como dice el doctor Harris, o desaprobar los planteamientos con los que uno llega, llega a campo o llega, llega en el terreno. ¿no? Eso es muy importante que tengamos entonces en cuenta este método Harris no tanto como, como un fin, sino como una herramienta, ¿no es cierto? Una herramienta que nos permita organizar una, una correcta secuencia estratigráfica para poder tener una correcta interpretación de los eventos eh, sociales o históricos que acontecieron en los lugares que estamos excavando. Finalmente, lo que hacemos nosotros es, es ciencia social, ¿no es cierto? Y es análisis histórico, sociológico, político, económico, entre otros. ¿no? Eso es muy, muy importante que lo tengamos claro, sobre todo para el momento de plantearnos las preguntas. ¿no? Invito también a todos los, la, los participantes acá a que puedan descargar gratuitamente el, el programa Harris, Harris, Harris Composer, 
que lo pueden descargar este, de internet con ese nombre, ¿no? que es, la, es, es el programa que digamos que es el, el programa que mejor aplica los, los, los principios de la, la materia de Harry, lo, utiliz, lo utilizamos con mis estudiantes de este curso, Tenemos, hemos pasado muchas horas este, utilizándolo, analizando los, los cortes eh, estratigráficos, los dibujos de perfil, y pues es bastante, ha sido muy útil para nosotros y que eh, para poder realizar secuencias estratigráficas, para poder proponer fases y periodificaciones, ¿no? Eh, pues siempre pues de manera de los sitios que vayamos a investigar. ¿no? Espero que esto, y estoy seguro que esto les va a servir mucho en sus trabajos de investigación, en sus tesis, en sus futuras tesis, y a los arqueólogos profesionales también pues seguir desarrollando, eh, digamos, correctamente los métodos de la excavación arqueológica, que como ustedes saben es destrucción. Y una destrucción ¿no? siempre tiene que ser que estar orientada a la reconstrucción posterior, pues al menos en una reconstrucción hipotética y científica. Eh, muchísimas gracias, doctor Harris, y muchísimas gracias, eh, doctor, doctor Marley, eh, por estar presentes acá. I'm, I'm saying thank you very much for your presence here, uh, talking to the students and to all the uh, guests here, uh, how important it's to to recognize the uh, um, a well uh, sequence, stratigraphical uh, sequence, to build and to reconstruct uh, the history, the political, the economics of, of the peoples that we study. That, that's, that is finally the, the big objective of the archaeology society. Uh, a final word, Dr. Harris and Dr. Ram, please. I'm, no, thank you very much. You've been very, very 